Uh, let's talk about the narratives of the sacrifice. Sacrifice from sacra and facere, uh, from the Latin, meaning to do something sacred. That's logatan in its etymology, in its uh, technical meaning, to give up something for God, right? Uh, so when we look at uh, the biblical narrative, Genesis 22, and I won't talk for that long because we're on a time crunch and we need to eat and I'm smelling burgers. Anyway, Genesis 22, uh, this passage is actually called Ha'aqaida, which means the binding, the binding of Isaac. Uh, there's a hapax legomenon. It's one of those fancy words we like to throw out there. This is a word that uh, only uh, occurs once in the entire scripture, vayaqud, and he bound him, right? Uh, the word aqidah in Hebrew is related to the word aqidah in Arabic. Aqidah sometimes translated as creed uh, or beliefs that are binding upon you, right? So we are told here that God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, uh, and, uh, and uh, Isaac, and offer him. Take your son, sorry, take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him on Mount Moriah. Now, interestingly... Um, we know that Abraham had more than one son during this time. His firstborn son, according to the Torah, was Ismail. But if you listen to, or if you're familiar with anti-Muslim rhetoric or polemics, they'll say, yeah, but, you know, Abraham is commanding Ishmael, or sorry, uh, Abraham, to sacrifice the son whom he loves, right? So implying that he doesn't love his other son. He doesn't love Ishmael. Right? Which is very interesting because if you go to the commentaries, rabbinical commentaries, on this uh, verse, 22.2 of Genesis of Bereshith, for example, Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki, who is the father of Jewish exegesis, uh, a European rabbi who died, I think, the 12th century of the Common Era. In his exegesis of the Aqidah passage, he quotes from the Talmud, Sanhedrin 89b, which gives the fuller dialogue, because Orthodox Jews believe in an oral law, not just a written law, right? On Sinai, Moses was given a written law, which is the Pentateuch, the Chumash, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but also was given an oral law, which is sort of a commentary on the written law, right? So we can't ignore the oral law. The fuller conversation between Abraham and God is given in the oral law. So this is what it says, according to Rashi. It says, God told uh, Abraham, take your son. And then Abraham said, Shanei benim yeshli. That's some Hebrew for you. Here's a joke for you. How does Maimonides make his coffee? He brews it. <laughs> All right. Sorry, these are the jokes. So Abraham's response was, I have two sons. Right? Take your son. He's Shanei Benim Yeshli. Two sons I have. And then God tells him, Eth Yachidika, your only son. And then Abraham says, Zeh Yachid Le'immo, Vezeh Yachid Le'immo. This is the only son of his mother, meaning Ismail, Ishmael, Yishmael, God hears. And this is the only son of his mother, meaning Yitzchak. It's interesting, the names of prophets, they're very, uh, there's secrets in the names of prophets. Ishmael, Yasma'ahullah, means God will hear. And Isaac means laughter. Laughter. Why does his name mean laughter? Because according to the Quranic narrative, when uh, the angels came to Sarah and Abraham, they said they're going to have a son. It says, فَضَّحِكَتْ She laughed and said, I'm going to have a son. I'm going to have a son. I'm an old woman. Look at my husband. He's 100 years old, literally. He's 100 years old. So they named their son Laughter. Anyway, so Abraham says, this is the only son of his mother. This is the only son of his mother. So then God says to Abraham, Asher Ahavta, the one whom you love. Right? The one whom you love. Now, what is the response of Abraham according to the oral law in the Talmud quoted by uh, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki, the founder of Jewish exegesis, 
in Sanhedrin 89b, what does Abraham respond with? He says, Shanei him anni ohev. Both of them I love. Both of them I love. It's really important when we study scripture, the text of a scripture, we have to study tradition. We have to study exegesis. Because I can quote anything and make anyone look completely violent. I can take something from the Summa of Aquinas and make him look like a homicidal maniac. I can quote something from the Talmud and make the rabbis look crazy. I can quote something from the Quran, which is done to me all the time, and say, oh, your ad religion advocates violence. You get the point. The first, th the first three rules, as I say, of uh, hermeneutics or scriptural interpretation is? Context. Good. Context, what's the second rule? Context. Context, third rule? Context. Context. Like the first three rules of real estate? Uh, location. location, location, location. Good. All right. So he says, Shanae him ani ohev. Both of them I love. And then God said to him, Eth Yitzchak, Isaac. I mean Isaac. Right? So we glean from the fuller uh, biblical narrative that Abraham loves both of his sons. Now, what's interesting is that when we look at uh, the Quranic narrative, of the Aqidah. The identity of the son is not given in the Quran. This is in Surah 37, Safat. We're not given the identity. He's not named. That's all he's called. A forbearing son. We don't know his name. The narrative goes on to say, Abraham, Abraham peace be upon him, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had a dream. So he goes to his son, whoever this son is, and he says, Inni arafil manami, anni azbahuka, fanzur mava tara. Which is very interesting. So he says, My son, Ya Bunaya, oh my dear son, I have had a dream. And we know from prophetology, Islamic prophetology, that when a prophet has a dream, it is a true dream. That I've had a dream that I'm sacrificing you. What do you think about that? Very interesting. So in the biblical narrative, Abraham does not tell his son Isaac what's happening until they're actually going up the hill of Moriah. And then Isaac turns to his father and says, where is the sheep for the, for the, for the, for the offering? God himself will provide a sheep. But here in the Quranic narrative, he tells his son, Fandur ma'adha tara? What do you think about that? And the response of his son is, Ya abati, O oh my dear father, if al ma tu'maru, do what you've been commanded. You will find me if God wills from the patient. All right? You will find me if God wills from the patient. So then, aslama, The Quran says, And then when both of them had submitted their wills to God, they had both entered into a state of total submission. Right? And Abraham was going to slaughter his son. And then the angel cried out, Ya Ibrahim, Qad sadaqta ru'ya. The angel stopped him and said, Oh Abraham, you have fulfilled your vision. You have fulfilled your dream. The command of God was not to kill your son. The command of God was for you to be willing to sacrifice uh, the thing that is most dear to you in this entire world. Right? So this is true sacrifice. Being able to... Uh, being able to um, uh, love God because God deserves to be loved and knowing that all of these things that he gives to us um, are a gift from God and ultimately the affair is all about God, right? Now, there is an opinion, right, that this son is Isaac in the Islamic tradition. There are big apostolic authorities, that is to say, big sahaba, companions of the prophet, who said, this is Isaac. And a lot of Muslims don't know that. Like Imam Ali, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Imam ibn Jarir al-Tabari says in his seminal exegesis, Jami' al-Bayan, that this son is Isaac. Why? Now, the dominant opinion is that it's Ishmael. Later exegetes would say that it's Ishmael. Right? Because after you have the narrative of the Aqidah in the Quran, then you have وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاقَ نَبِيًّا مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And we gave glad tidings of Isaac. Now, is this verse sort of summarizing the Aqidah narrative? Or is this moving on a new idea? There's a difference of opinion. 
right? So there's a genuine difference of opinion amongst Muslim exegetes, who is the son? The dominant opinion is that it's Ishmael. Because for the Muslim, it's not really a big issue. The Ibrah, the lesson is the most important. Early church fathers, uh, it was a big deal for them because the uh, binding of Isaac uh, is a uh, Christological typology, like for origin of Alexandria, Justin Martyr. It's kind of foreshadowing what God is going to do to his own quote unquote son in the New Testament, sacrifice his son. So it's very important for him to be Isaac, an ancestor of Christ. And for many Jewish authorities, it's also important that it be Isaac, because he is the progenitor of the Bani Israel, the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. But from the Muslim perspective, it shouldn't be a point of contention. It doesn't matter from our perspective who the son was. Okay. Um, that's all I wanted to say, really. <laughs> but if we have time for questions, I don't know how we're doing on time. If you have, you can ask me anything you want. How's your day going? My day is well, thank you very much. Very nice. I woke up a little bit, woke up today, read a little bit. It's always good to read every day. Should improve every day, right? Learn something, learn a new vocab word. Progenitor. Huh? Progenitor. Progenitor, hypoxlegomenon, what else? <laughs> Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Actually, can, can you comment a little bit about why, like, focusing on universals such as sacrifice may be more important than focusing on, like, the particular? Yeah, the question is, why is uh, focusing on a universal more important than the particular? And Brother Yusuf said, focusing on sacrifice. Uh, focusing on, on the particular, uh, the, sorry, the general, I think, is one of the main uh, 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 discourses, if you will, or thematic elements of the Qur'an itself, the Qur'an says, مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ مشركين. So, Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian, but he was an archetypal monotheist, someone who submitted his will to God. So what the Qur'an is attempting to do here is uh, to establish Islam as being this Religion that is not uh, somehow bound by tribal affiliations um, or any of these types of, of identifications. That this is a universal religion, that Islam is not a religion that, at least how Muslims understand it, Islam is not an amalgamation of Judaism, Christianity, and you know, pre-Islamic Arab paganism, but rather that Islam is a sort of recapturing of the actual tradition of Abraham. And that's what the Hajj, the pilgrimage is all about, right? The rites of the Hajj, the pilgrimage, go back to Abraham. They don't start with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They have origins in Abraham, the father, right? Millata abikum Ibrahim. As the Quran says, this is the religion of your father, your spiritual father, Abraham, right? Um, and we find this idea also in the New Testament, in the gospel of John, um, that, you know, if you were Abraham's children, you would do as Abraham did in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19 or 18. Uh, Jesus says about Zacchaeus, a very short man who was hiding in a tree, this man too is a son of Abraham, right? So this idea of recapturing that original message of the patriarch, um, that's the most important. That's why you don't have a lot of name dropping in the Quran. You don't have a lot of long genealogies in the Quran. The, the story of Joseph, there's only a few people named. There's only one woman named in the entire Quran because the point is not to name drop. The point is to teach true lessons that are transcendental. We get, we get uh, caught up on names, then we become tribal, we become racist, right? We start to exclude others, become exclusionary, right? We start to identify the other based on a name or tribal distinction.